All right, so last time we talked about the main idea behind lightweight cryptography, why we need it and so on. So in this talk, I will uh, look at some of the target devices and performance metrics. Actually, uh, I'm focusing my talk on the NIST report, which is titled Report on Lightweight Cryptography. So let's recall NIST Lightweight Cryptography project. In 2013, NIST initiated a lightweight cryptography project to study the performance of the current NIST approved cryptographic standards on constraint devices. The aim was to understand the uh, need for dedicated lightweight cryptography standards, and if the need is identified, to design a transparent process for standardization. Uh, and this was the idea. And for this reason, they held two lightweight cryptography workshops into solicit the following public feedback on the constraints and limitations of the target devices, requirements and characteristics of real world applications of lightweight cryptography. So in 2013, the idea was as follows. Uh, NIST had an uh, encryption standard called AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. So they wanted to check if this algorithm is good for every platform and every device. Uh, so these uh, two workshops uh, were held with uh, academicians, but also people from industry to identify if we need really a lightweight algorithm. So after these uh, two workshops and uh, uh, from the feedback NIST, decided to create a portfolio of lightweight algorithms through an open process. In other words, a competition or a standardization process. So there's an internal report with the number 8114, which is titled Report on Lightweight Cryptography. And in this report, NIST aims to uh, summarize the findings of the lightweight cryptography project outline this plans for the standardization of lightweight algorithms. It is actually a good report and I recommend you to read it. So uh, after this point on, they uh, held many workshops, as you can see from the dates here. Uh, and uh, during this time, the competition started and uh, just last year uh, in March, they announced the finalists. There were 10 uh, finalists and now they're in the process of eliminating more and we don't know if they are going to select only one finalist or more than one but as i mentioned before uh, industry and the NIST wants to have a single uh, winner because this way it is easier to have the standardization process for NIST and for the industry if there's only one winner they will only implement that algorithm but if there are two winners then they have to implement both of them which is, you know, against the main idea behind having lightweight cryptography. So you can check the previous workshops and, you know, uh, see what has happened until now. So the last workshop, due to pandemic, last two workshops were uh, virtual. Last one was held this year. So we will see what will happen. And if you're interested, you can join the mailing list and, you know, receive the updates and discussion between the designers and the analyzers. So what are our target devices? Lightweight cryptography targets a wide variety of devices that can be implemented on a broad spectrum of hardware and software. On the high end of the device spectrum are servers, desktop computers, tablets, and smartphones. So th at this part, we actually have very good algorithms and these devices are not constrained devices. So they actually they can run many uh, complicated algorithms. So in this part, we don't have a problem. But uh, if we want to implement an algorithm for lightweight devices, since those devices are going to communicate with these high-end devices, we have to uh, consider all of them. Conventional cryptographic algorithms generally perform well in these devices, so they don't require lightweight algorithms, okay? Because we have very fast CPUs, gigabytes of memory, so having a very light algorithm is not a uh, desired property for desktop computers or laptops and so on. But on the lower end of the spectrum are devices such as embedded systems, RFID devices, sensor networks, and lightweight cryptography is primarily focused on these highly constrained devices because some of them has very limited battery, some of them doesn't even have battery, and so on. So let's start with microcontrollers. 
microcontrollers are available with a wide array of performance attributes. Although 8-bit, 16-bit, and 32-bit microcontrollers are the most common, there are significant sales of 4-bit microcontrollers for certain ultra-low cost applications. So when you are designing an algorithm, you also have to consider this one. So they work on 4-bits. So, you know, uh, working on bytes becomes a problem on these devices and so on. A wide variety of instruction sets exist, which typically only contain a small number of simple instructions on these microcontrollers. So you cannot uh, do uh, every operation that easily. Some of the devices, for instance, might not have the uh, end operation or exit operation. Of course, almost all of them do, but you know, maybe some basic arithmetic operations might not exist for some devices. That is what I'm trying to say. So this may result in a large number of cycles to execute common cryptographic algorithms, which may make them too slow or energy consuming for the intended application. For instance, consider shift operation. We have shift operation on our CPU instructions, but maybe these low uh, cost devices do doesn't have shift operation. So if you design an algorithm that performs shift operation, it might run very slow on these devices. So you have to always know the hardware you are working on and then do the implementation. This is particularly a problem when it is necessary to satisfy real-time constraints using a limited amount of energy. Because uh, you, if you are going to perform 10 instructions for a single instruction, then you will lose a lot of energy and you will lose performance. So for some microcontrollers, the amount of random access memory and read-only memory can be extremely limited. Here's a, just an example. For example, following microcontrollers can have 64 bytes of RAM or less, going down to as little as 16 bytes of RAM. Just imagine how you are going to perform operations with that amount of uh, memory. If you go years back, you know, Commodore 64 had 64 kilobytes of memory, but we still in 2022 have very small devices that has less memory than Commodore 64. So implementations and, you know, performance really affected by the memory. So once you are designing an algorithm, you also need to consider how much memory you need to perform that operation in a fast way. Uh, other things we need to consider, uh, aside from microcontrollers, we also have to look at uh, radio frequency identification tags, sensor networks. On the bottom of the spectrum, there are RFID and sensor networks, which are often realized in an application-specific integrated circuit, ASIC, in order to satisfy some of the most stringent implementation constraints. Of particular interest are ultra-high frequency RFID tags, for example, tags using the widely deployed EPC Global Generation 2 and IOS standard, uh, this uh, IOS standard for you know ultra high frequency tags. For RFID tags that are not battery powered, only a limited amount of power is available from the environment. This is actually valid for smart cards. You know, generally don't have, they don't have any battery at all. You move it next to the readers. So due to the reader's radio frequency or electromagnetic field, they have very limited amount of power. So this is why uh, you can do little amount of work with those devices. Of course, if you're, you have a more complicated device, then you need more energy. Uh, you can think about passwords for that case. For instance, when the give your password to the person uh, when you're traveling abroad, they put it on a device and they wait a few seconds to re so because the device reboots when it receives that power because it requires a lot of power to perform those operations. But for those you know small tags that we open the doors of these buildings and so on, they require uh, less energy. Such devices require cryptographic algorithms that not only use a very small amount of gate equivalents, but also meet stringent timing and power requirements because. When you use small amount of gates, this only reduces the area that you need, but this doesn't say anything about performance, right? So you also need to, you know, uh, have a good throughput and or less latency. So lightweight algorithms may be subject to various other constraints, a topic that will be explored during the first phase of the standardization effort. So during this workshop, these are 
considered. The aforementioned examples are therefore not intended to be an exhaustive list, but instead to illustrate settings where conventional algorithms cannot be implemented in order to understand the need for lightweight alternatives. So this was just examples. And uh, when I was preparing this course, uh, we were about to have the third lightweight crypto workshop. And uh, a talk from there is uh, addressing to this problem. If you're interested, I recommend you to read uh, Cryptography in Industrial Embedded Systems, Our Experience of Needs and Constraints by Jean-Philippe Omoson and Anthony Venner. So there actually we can see what kind of constraints we have and what things we should focus on. So while lightweight cryptography primarily targets devices at the low end of the device spectrum, it is important to note that it may be it might be it may be necessary to implement lightweight algorithms at the high end of the spectrum as well. Just remember the NIST uh, definition for the network of things. Although we have very small devices like sensors and so on, they are communicated with they are communicating with aggregators, and aggregators are maybe communicating with computers and so on. So even if you implement these algorithms on these small devices at the end they have to talk to the high-end devices so their performance also should be well there for example many resource constraint sensors may send information to an aggregator that by most accounts is not constrained however the aggregator must support lightweight algorithms in order to interoperate with the constraint sensors when they use lightweight cryptographic algorithms that is what i was trying to explain in short the environment and the application need to be factored into the decision of whether or not uh, conventional standards are acceptable. So here we mean that you have to check if a yes is good enough for you. But if the performance is not good enough for you on a sensor, then you have to consider that you need another algorithm. So for the very small devices like the 4-bit uh, microcontrollers, a yes will not be suitable for you or uh, devices with 16 bytes of memory, you wouldn't be able to you know, keep the S-box in the memory and so on. So it is not just the limitation of a particular device that derives the need for lightweight cryptography, but also the other devices in the application that it directly interacts with. So, okay, we are saying that our algorithms are fast, but then with the 5G and so on, the communication bandwidth really increases. So a lot of devices want to communicate in a very fast way. So you still need uh, lightweight algorithms for these devices so that the encryption and the decryption can be performed in a very fast way, even on a very strong service. 